Like, I'm not kidding. There was this guy named Greasy, or that was the nickname he told people to call him by. And with a sub 315 squat, he would continue to handicap his progress by spending more time in the couch stretch position than under a goddamn squat bar. Big thank you to Boost Camp for sponsoring this channel. Check out my programs and many others absolutely free on Boost Camp. There's a ton of controversy around massage guns, foam rolling, and other therapies that are generally labeled under the umbrella of myofascial release. Since these methods pop up pretty frequently, both in your local gym and in the warm-up areas of world championships, I thought I'd give my two cents about it. There's kind of a crazy, hippie, holistic, natural remedy type of cult around a lot of mobility stuff. Some of it's rooted in Eastern practices, like acupuncture and scraping, and some of that overlaps with chiropractics, and a lot of those methods bleed into generic, widely accepted Western practices like physical therapy. Thankfully, the almost religious proselytizing of the message of mobility has died down from where it was around around 2010, when everybody was carrying around supple leopard like it was the King James Bible. And I get why people push back against movement hygiene taken too far. As someone who ran a gym around the height of the mobility fever, I can remember the fury I felt from watching the undertrained, inexperienced powerlifter newbies show up to train in their singlets, only to take up a squat rack for 45 minutes while doing hip distraction drills with a band strapped around their leg. Like, I'm not kidding. There was this guy named Greasy, or that was the nickname he told people to call him by who sported a man bun and one of those homeless tier beards with the handlebar mustache, he would train in a tight, tight-eyed singlet with no underwear, and with a sub-315 squat, he would continue to handicap his progress by spending more time in the couch stretch position than under a goddamn squat bar. It's almost as infuriating to watch as when an equally undertrained lifter takes time out of their training to do bazooka lifts and barbell spinaroonies. But I'm gonna move on. That horse is dead. So trust me, I get the criticism around mobility culture. But for every oily strength hipster who takes the effort that should go into training and instead redirects it towards letting people know that they train, there are a dozen athletes who legitimately have problems that need solving and who may benefit from some of these interventions. So there's two points that I want to address in this video. One, are the claims around mobility work, myofascial release, and other types of self-maintenance therapies legit, or do they grossly get wrong vital points about how the human body actually works? And two, regardless of whether or not these models are correct or not, do these modes of therapy still have value? If so, which ones have value and in what circumstances? So let's get into the science. The industry around mobility and movement therapies largely concern themselves with a discussion of fascia. This is the connective tissue that surrounds your entire body. There's superficial fascia, which exists right under the skin, and there's visceral fascia, which keeps your organs in place. We are primarily concerned with the deep fascia, which is the layer that sheathes your entire musculature. A lot of the claims around these types of therapies revolve around their purported ability to break up adhesions and scar tissue, and to mechanically restructure your fascia and release trigger points. The entire model is evident in the name, myofascial release, which suggests that the fascia is something that can actually be released. Now there's a kind of problem here. The fascia is insanely strong, and you want it that way. You shouldn't necessarily want it to be able to be loosened, weakened, or broken up by something as simple as rolling around on a piece of PVC or a tennis ball. If it does work that way, you would think something like sitting would eventually just dissolve your glutes, or that a run-of-the-mill massage would turn your fascia into soup. And also our understanding around things like adhesions is that you have to actually twist them to break them apart, and that if you're just pushing down on them, you're only going to compress them, and that that's not going to do anything to actually break them up. Now most actual massage techniques are going to involve this, but foam rolling and massage guns won't. There's also an idea that these mechanisms can release trigger points in the muscle, but the problem there is that we don't actually know what a trigger point is. Some people will describe them as knots, where areas of the muscle are frozen into a contracted state. Some will describe them as glued down tissue that has to be broken up with force. I know I've experienced something that I would call knots, and I know that a lot of work on them tends to make them feel better. But that might not be because the work actually caused some breaking down of the tissue or some mechanical change in the way that the tissue is structured. To start, we have to understand that fascia isn't just the junk filler tissue that it was initially thought to be. It is now actually thought of as an entire sensory organ in its own right. It has a density of sensory nerves that actually rivals that of your retina, and it's part of a web that encompasses your entire body. We know that in any given movement, there's communication to each muscle, but the fascia that connects all muscles seems to be an integral part of the communication that occurs from one body part to another. This nerve-based signal seems to be responsible for the effects we see with these types of therapies. We know that the human body has a mechanism for inhibition to prevent you from causing further harm. 
So when an area is vulnerable, like an inflamed tendon, or when the load is too great for a structure to handle, the nervous system might actually restrict movements or inhibit force altogether to prevent further harm. If any of you have ever benched with an inflamed elbow, you know what I'm talking about. It's not just that your elbow hurts, it's that you actually have a hard time lowering and pressing even a very light weight under control. You can actually demonstrate this to yourself right now. Do a toe touch to gauge your basic flexibility, then take a tennis ball and step on it and use it to give the bottom of your foot a massage. Repeat this on the other foot and after about 30 seconds, retest your flexibility. You should notice that there is an immediate increase in your range of motion. Because the fascia from the feet is interconnected to the fascia that runs up your posterior, manipulating that body part has an effect across the rest of your body. Working on your foot can increase flexibility through your calf, hamstring, and glutes. This is why fascia is referred to as a sensory organ, because it seems that information is being passed from one body part to another via this chain of connective tissue. And in that way, we're not just a series of muscles that move independently like gears in a machine. Our muscle tissue and the fascia that surrounds it can be thought of as one cohesive unit. Now the studies around things like massage and myofascial release seem to point to one measurable piece of improvement and that's range of motion. All of this stuff does increase flexibility in the short term. Most of the skepticism around these modalities has more to do with the claims that have been made beyond that point. So claims that it can lower recovery time, claims that it can move blood around, things that it can create permanent changes to the tissue. There doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence pointing to those things, so you can see why people would be skeptical at an industry that leans heavily on those claims. Also, the improvements of range of motion from massage guns or foam rolling don't seem to be better than stretching, which is free and requires zero equipment. And for a lot of people, that's another nail in the coffin. But here's the piece of information that's extremely relevant to lifters. Massage therapies increase range of motion without sacrificing force production. Stretching does not. So if you are at a contest or getting ready for a big attempt at the gym, you want to use methods that don't sap your strength. And that's where something like a massage gun comes in. Now guys, because myofascial release techniques can be very valuable to athletes and gym goers alike, I wanted to make a recommendation based on what I use. I have previously reviewed Bob and Brad's economy option. So I use this when I travel across the country. It doesn't take up much space. It does what I need it to. But the pro option for getting into those really stubborn areas, those really big knots where you need a lot of aggressive force to get yourself moving right again, but you don't have time to go book a massage appointment, this is their D6 Pro Massage Gun. And let me tell you guys, I'm impressed. First of all, it's important for you guys to know that this is not a paid endorsement. I do have an affiliate link in the description, so check it out if you're interested. But when it comes to affiliate stuff, I find good products and then post the link, not the other way around. So this I was very impressed with. Compared to the $500 plus dollar Theragun, this weighs less, has 25 pounds more stall force, 85 compared to the Theragun 60, and it matches its amplitude, 16 millimeters. So that's how deep it gets. I tell you what, my pec insertions have been feeling a little tight. So let's do a little uh, experiment here and see how the D6 Pro handles it. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, that is, that is something. But if I wanna get my lats, cause I know my lats give me problems going into like overhead presses, hand over the head, it just, it's angled perfectly. You don't have to have your spouse, your significant other, a stranger at the gym come put the gun to you. Let's turn this bad boy all the way up. Listen to that. Listen to how quiet that is. My wife's hair dryer is louder than that. It peaks out at 2,500 pulses per minute. I'm almost scared. Oh, that's gonna rival what Ingrid can do with the massage parlor. And just like that, the pressure sent a signal over the fascia, that signal to release, to allow for more motion. And I can already feel I can get my elbow higher. I can already feel that my external rotation's better. This is a vital tool. When I'm training at home, this is my go-to. So if you guys are in the market for a heavy duty massage gun that's gonna hit those stubborn areas, I strongly recommend the D6 Pro Massage Gun. It is literally double the value, half the price for better performance compared to the Theragun Pro. So check it out. Now let's get into what this means in terms of application. So I'm still a fan of, and I still use these types of interventions, regardless of how conclusive the evidence is or isn't. What we do know is that it causes an immediate increase in flexibility, which I desperately need when I'm cold and rigid and moments out from a big deadlift attempt at an 8 a.m. meet. And it allows me to do that without compromising my strength. In addition to that, there is a general sense of readiness that these rituals bring that might be entirely imaginary, but still have a positive effect on performance. The psychology of performance doesn't just apply to athletes and Navy SEALs. Being effective in the gym requires a specific mindset and how each individual human being gets to that state is highly individualized. And the process to get there usually ends up involving a bunch of silly shit that might not be confirmed in a lab setting. 
Long story short, placebo effect is still in effect. If doing that nonsense haka impression before your sumo deadlift makes you feel more prepared to pull, then I guess it's in your best interest to do that. I mean, I can make a video talking about how hiking up your singlet and doing the twerking stripper foot twist like you're putting out a cigarette doesn't do anything to actually facilitate a better deadlift execution. But that assessment is meaningless to those who benefit from the sense of preparedness they get from it. I can call it imaginary, but sports psychology is definitionally imaginary. Now, my take on this is that it does a bit better than just being a harmless placebo that tricks you into being ready. I think it actually provides some tangible benefit. Oftentimes, my opinions are informed by the habits I've observed in the warm-up rooms at Worlds over the years, and that can sometimes conflict with what we can confidently conclude given the evidence. The fact is, a lot of guys bring lacrosse balls, foam rollers, and massage guns across the country to help them get ready for the biggest meets of their lives. I'm not just talking about the guys at their third strongman contest who bring a body bag full of physio toys because they are still in the buy every wish ad phase of lifting. I'm talking about people that have been doing this for a long time, people that have an established routine, people that show up a half hour early so they have time to go through their rituals before the actual event warmups happen. These are the same people who dedicate the night before to stretching and recovery and people that are very in tune with how their body moves and exactly what they need to do to get into a competitive state of mind. And these people are going to use foam rollers and massage guns for the same reason that I do, because it actually helps reduce the feeling of stiffness and it increases your range of motion and that immediately makes everything go off better. The thing that a lot of people don't know, as you get bigger, you get stiffer. If you've gone from weighing 160 to 180, you might have noticed this a little bit, but when you go from 180 to 250, you notice it a lot. As the glutes, delts, hamstrings, pecs, biceps, and quads increase in size, they can become bound if they're not regularly put through a wide range of motion, especially if you're one of these guys that thinks you can get ever bigger without doing any maintenance stretching and still maintain a reasonable amount of flexibility. Spoiler alert, you can't. So when you are at rest for a long time, like after a full night's sleep, or when you've been sitting in a car for a 10 hour drive, because you decided to drive solo from Southern California to Idaho because you wanted to try out their lever deadlift, no regrets. More than a little bit of prep is going to be warranted before you can hop out of the car and start tugging away. I've experienced even in the middle of the day when I'm moving around that simple tasks like crossing my legs to put on my shoes or bending over to tie my shoes becomes obnoxiously difficult. A lot of my life inconveniences from lifting revolve around getting to my feet. So times where I need to get ready fast, like right before a squat workout or minutes before the warmups for a four inch deficit deadlift, any intervention that is going to alleviate some of that tightness is worthwhile. If massage guns have been shown to do anything, it's to marginally increase range of motion without showing a decrease in strength or performance. Stretching is fantastic and it's free, but done right before a workout or a heavy lift, it's been shown to reduce force production. Now, if you're like me and your muscles are usually the consistency of an old tire left out in the desert, I do recommend you suck it up and stretch. It's a much bigger priority to fix that, which can turn into a bigger problem, than it is to be 2% stronger in your deadlift workout today. But right before a competition, when your performance actually does matter, massage guns and foam rolling are superior to stretching because they do not come with this side effect. So building off of that four inch deficit deadlift that I had to prep for, that was an extremely difficult position for me to get into. I could not get to the bar without a bunch of round in my spine, and I was pretty sure that I was going to get injured during that prep. My strategy for those workouts was to use rolling and massage guns to get my hips and glutes loosened up so that I could get into a better position. And I did my deep stretching after my pulling work was done. That way, every week that I trained, I was getting a little better, a little more confident until I was finally able to handle the contest weight. This is a strategy I take forward in every show that I do now. Light movement to start out to get the blood in the joint, followed by some directed massage to get me just mobile enough to accommodate the movement with confidence. After that, all of my warm-ups are done directly with the implements. It works like a charm. I can go from being dead cold to on deck in five minutes if I have to, and I recommend that you make it a goal to be able to do the same. Meets are extremely unpredictable. You're not always going to be able to get the exact warm-up that you want, so you need to know exactly how to get yourself ready, and that will actually carry over to your training sessions. It's only in your best interest if after a long day's work, you don't have to spend so much time getting yourself ready to get under the squat bar or to start your heavy deadlifts. So that's my two cents on myofascial release. I hope this was educational. I think movement hygiene is extremely important and I think more people would be better off if they did dedicate some time to increasing range of motion, to stretching, to doing some type of self-care. Just as long as you're not pulling a greasy and doing 45 minutes of supple leopard work when your ass should be working. So thanks so much for watching, guys. Leave your questions and comments in the comments. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.